the way we version software matters a lot. The primary function is, of course, to uniquely identify a release of something, but it goes way beyond that. It helps the team working on an application understand better what that release is. It helps other teams within the same organization understand better what you released. There are quite a few different ways how we can version our software and I will limit this exploration to a few that are most commonly used today or a few that matters the most and I will sprinkle it a bit with some funny ones or silly ones, we'll see. We'll go through build numbers as one of the ways to version software, calendar versioning, semantic versioning, but also marketing versioning or how some companies are versioning their software based on marketing motivations rather than helping fellow engineers understand what we just released. There are some silly versioning schemes and there are some geeky versioning schemes. We are going to go through them all. Build number versioning is probably the most commonly used one and the easiest one to do. Typically we would use some form of pipelines or workflows to run builds, to create releases, run tests and what's so not. And all those provide build numbers. For example, if you use Jenkins, the first build uh, of a branch of a repository would be build number one and then build number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and so on and so forth. And it is very convenient just to take that build number and say, okay, the first release of my application is build one, and the second is build two, and the third might be build five because builds number three and four fail, so we did not really release anything. However, even though versioning with build numbers is the easiest one, it's also the silliest one. The only thing we are getting is unique identifier of a release, which is extremely important, but nothing else beyond that. As a user or maybe engineer that depends on a release of something, knowing that there is a release 17 means nothing to me because, hey, what's the difference between 16 and 17? And what will be the difference between 17 and 18? Nobody knows. It's just a unique identifier and has no other meaning beyond that. We might make it slightly easier and say, hey, the build number will be prefixed with the branch name, for example. So master 17 means that it is stable. It is the release from a master. And my feature 35 is just something temporary. Or a PR 73 is something that is also temporary and not yet released. Nevertheless, using build numbers is silly. Just as it is silly, for example, to use git commit hashes uh, or some other unique identifier that mean nothing to an end user. Then we have calendar versioning and probably the best example and the most commonly used example could be, let's say Ubuntu. Let's take a look at how Ubuntu versions its software. The current release at the time of this recording is 21.04. It is unique, so that's a good thing because it is not the same as previous release, which was 20.10. And it is a clear indication at least when somebody released that specific distribution of Ubuntu. 2104 means that it was released in 2021 and during April or the fourth month of the year. And if you follow Ubuntu, you know that there are two releases a year. So the previous one was 20.10, the one before that 20.04 and so on and so forth. There are intermediary releases with hotfixes and patches. So the GA release 20.04 could be later on released as 20.04.01 and the one after that 20.04.02 and so on and so forth. So the last number, the one after the year and the month is incremented by one with every patch release or hotfix release or any intermediary release. And typically if you just install 20.04, you would not actually get 20.04, you would get the latest one in that patch, which could be 20.04 and then 17, let's say, or, or 13 or whatever is the latest patch or uh, hotfix release of that batch of that major release. The format of calendar releases is usually, not always, but typically year followed with the month and optional date 
or patch or something like that. It usually depends on the frequency of your releases. If you're releasing twice a year, then you would use only a year and a month. If you're releasing multiple times a month, then you would add the day there and so on and so forth. And the reason why it starts with a year instead of month or a day is because of the ordering scheme. It is easier to order something in, let's say, ascending or descending order when it starts with a year and then month and then date. The use cases for calendar versioning is usually if the scope is large, so you're not typically releasing frequently. Similarly, you might use calendar versioning when something is time sensitive. From business perspective, you might want to say, hey, I want my users to know that we are releasing something uh, every first Monday of a month or every half a year or something like that. It could also be very good for security updates. People might want to know that, hey, we are getting the latest and the latest one is only five days old. And how do you know that something is only five days old? Well, because the version number is based on a calendar year, month, day. Sometimes it is also mixed with releases. So we might have 2021 release one, 2021 release two. That is typically silly because release one, two, three doesn't mean much to anybody, but at least you know the year when something was released. It's definitely better than if you just say release 57. Release five in 2021 is at least a better indication of something. Then we have semantic versioning. Semantic versioning might be the most commonly used one, at least outside of large uh, enterprises, which never manage to follow with technology and the patterns and what's or not. It tries to answer a couple of important questions, very important questions. Like, how do you know when to upgrade one of the dependencies that your application is using? That dependency could be an API or a library or anything else. So your applications are almost certainly depending on other applications. I'm yet to see any serious system that has a single application that doesn't have any dependencies, that doesn't communicate with any other application through its API and so on and so forth. So we always deal with some sort of dependencies. And when the time comes to upgrade those dependencies, we should know, hey, should they upgrade or not? And what are the repercussions of me upgrading the dependencies of my application? Or when should I change the version of the API of the application I'm communicating with? How do you know that it is safe? How do you know that it is better? backwards compatible? Should you expect breaking changes? Does that newer version contain only bug fixes or it contains some new features? Those are important questions which we can definitely find out by going through release notes and spending a lot of time reading, but wouldn't it be awesome to understand all those things just by looking at the version number and comparing it with the version you are currently using? Semantic versioning is based on three numbers, typically separated with the dots. There is major version, minor version, and patch. Three numbers. Incrementing the patch version means that we are making a hotfix. We are not introducing a new feature, and that hotfix is fully backwards compatible with whatever we had before. Incrementing a minor version means that we are introducing a new feature, a new functionality, but we are doing that in a backwards compatible way. So our users know that upgrading applications or dependencies of the applications mean that there is nothing else that should be changed. It is backwards compatible. We are getting new features or bug fixes depending on whether it's minor increment or patch increment, but there are no changes that we need to do in the application that uses that uh, upgraded dependency unless we want to leverage those new features. In any case, upgrading a dependency based on increased minor or patch version means that it is safe. It is backwards compatible, no code changes required for the application that uh, depends on the upgraded version of something. And then we have an increment of the major version. That means that there are new features added to that application or that dependency that are not, and I repeat, not backwards compatible. It means that there is work to be done in the application that uses that potentially upgradable dependency to make it work. That typically means that there is new API that is not backwards compatible with what was there before. Now, there are a couple of important rules with semantic versioning. And one of those is that once a version is released, it cannot be modified 
without increasing one of those numbers. So if you already created a release, let's say 1.5.7, you cannot re-release that same number. You cannot re-release that same version. If you want to make changes to the source code and make a new release, that new release cannot be based on the same number. One of those three needs to be incremented. So we are always increasing the patch number or minor number or major version depending on whether it is an internal change that is backwards compatible or it is a new feature that is still backwards compatible or it is a new feature that is not backwards compatible. But it gets slightly more complicated than that. If you increase the minor version, patch version must become zero. So patch version is always reset to zero whenever we increase the minor version. Similarly, if you increase the major version, then patch and minor versions are reset to zero. So if we have, for example, version 1.7.3, and then we want to make 1.8, it would be 1.8.0 because patch needs to reset. Similarly, if you want to increase from major 1 to major 2, then 1.7.5 would become 2.0.0. All the numbers to the right of the one we are increasing are reset to 0. We can also add suffixes as a way to show that something is a pre-release. So it could be alpha or beta or maybe build number and so on and so forth. As an example, let's take a look at releases of something. What would be a good candidate? Let's, let's say Kubernetes. Let's take a look at releases of Kubernetes itself. The latest one at the time of this recording is 1.21.1. That means that there were 21 minor releases, releases with new features that were backwards compatible. 21 minor releases were made since Kubernetes became 1.0.0. And since 1.21 became generally available, we got one patch release since then because the currently latest uh, Kubernetes version is 121.1. So one patch was made since then. And then we have releases like 1.22.0-alpha.1. That means that the future stable release of Kubernetes, which will be 1.22.0, is still in alpha phase. The one after that might be 1.22.0 alpha 2, 3, and then it will go to beta 1, 2, 3, and finally it will become GA, and then it will be only 1.22.0. That's the moment when it is generally available and the vast majority of us should start using it. Until then, while it is alpha, beta, what's or not, it is mostly for testing purposes. Or for early adopters that desperately need whatever is the new feature added there. And if you go through history of Kubernetes releases, there was 1.21, 1 1.20, 1 1.19 and so on and so forth. Since the generally available release of Kubernetes, which was 1.0.0, Kubernetes did not break backwards compatibility even once. That's why the major version is still 1. Next we have milestones or milestone versioning. That's typically when you version your software whichever way you do, but then you say, hey, my application is now version 2. And then after a while you would say, hey, my application is version 3. People do that mostly for marketing reasons, because for users, when you say, hey, version 2 of my application was just released, they think, wow, it must be something important. I must probably use it. Let me see what cool new things were added there. And that's only for marketing purposes. There is no logic behind that for the user. There is no way to discover just by looking at the number whether there is a hotfix release or a new feature that is backwards compatible or a new feature that is not backwards compatible. You just need to trust that company that, hey, you should maybe upgrade or maybe not. We don't know. Really, we don't know what will happen unless we read release notes. And that's a valid thing to do things. You should always read release notes, but it is useful when you can just look at the version number and say, hey, this is safe, this is not safe, there is a lot of work involved, there is not. When we use marketing schemas for versioning stuff, we have none of those things. They're designed to spark our interest without providing really information what it is, at least not the quick information based only on the version number. 
And then we have the worst one of all that are more or less random or specific to only one application or one company that means nothing within the bigger scope of the industry. Python has its own versioning, Tex has its own versioning, Apple has its own versioning, and so on and so forth. You cannot really deduce what was released just by looking at their versioning numbers. That does not mean that there is no logic behind them. Probably there is, but it is not a commonly accepted logic. Either you are very, very, very interested in that specific application, then you figure out how their versioning works, or maybe there is no logic behind versioning. Who knows? There are also some geeky things going on, and my favorite is SUSE. Their first version was 4.2. So the first GA or generally available version of SUSE was 4.2. On the first look, it makes no sense. Why would somebody start with 4.2? But 4.2 is actually a reference to 42. And this is the moment when some of you will understand what's going on, some of you will not. And whether you will understand or not depends on whether you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it is, and I will read this, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. It's a joke from a book that 42 is the answer to everything. Geeky stuff, nerdy stuff. Now let's go back to a more serious question. Which versioning schema should you use? Use calendar versioning or Calver if you want to make sure that your users understand when something was released and when will something else, something new, be released. It does not provide information whether it is safe, what to expect from that version, but it does provide schedule which might be important for some users. Like Ubuntu users like to know that, hey, every half a year we have a new release and this is the frequency of LTSs and this is the frequency of not LTSs and so on and so forth. Calendar versioning is usually used for big applications or platform and in general for users who do not care that much whether something is backwards compatible, whether there is a new feature or a patch and what's or not. Semantic versioning or semware is probably the best choice when you want to know and your users to know and the internal and everybody to know when to upgrade, when it is safe to upgrade and what to expect from a release. It is almost always the best choice when end users are technical or when end users are machines. So use calendar versioning if your end users are not that technical and semantic versioning when your users are technical. In most of the other cases, other versioning schemas are just silly. I mean, you can use something for marketing versioning, like call it Windows 10. Nobody knows why Windows 10 is called Windows 10, but it is probably good for marketing reasons. Nevertheless, Windows 10 probably has some serious versioning behind it, so I'm going to ignore it. Anyways, use other versioning schemas when your end users do not really care what you're releasing or when you're releasing something. For all other use cases, most likely you want semantic versioning and maybe optionally calendar versioning might be an alternative.